audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. Foundations. The book of Esther is the only one that doesn't specifically mention the name of God. There was a little bit of vacillation for a little while in that they vacillated over whether or not it should be included in the canon because it didn't contain the name of God. Foundations. Understanding the Jewish foundations of our Christian faith. With Robbo Robinson and Mandy Warby. At the moment, it's the anniversary of the Jewish holiday of Purim. Today it's celebrated as a fairly fun event with parties and lots of joy and laughter, but it is, in fact, the anniversary of a very serious event. It actually is. Actually, it's, it's, it's funny to be in Israel when they're celebrating Purim because, as you were just saying, it's a very festive occasion. Some people have equated it to the Jewish answer to Halloween, although... Unlike Halloween, it's got no dark occultic connotation to it. There's no witches, goblins, that kind of thing. That's not even part of it. But they do dress up in all various different costumes and they'll be out in the streets all night and they'll be partying and having a great time. Um, little Jewish girls will go into Esther beauty pageants and things <laughs> like that. So, um, yeah, they it's a really fun uh, event. Uh, it is a biblical uh, holiday, Jewish holiday, although it's not one of the seven mandatory feasts, but as far as the Jewish people concerned, it's a compulsory feast. It's mm. a part of their history. And it's, you're right, it's a very, very serious story. If you were to jump in and into your Bible and read the book of Esther, it's only 10 chapters long. It's not a very long book, but it gives the entire account. We're going to only touch a little bit on the story tonight because we've got a couple of programs to discuss Purim. The word Purim means lots because the sinister villain of this plot, Haman, he actually cast lots when he was trying to determine what day he should hatch his wicked, evil plan to exterminate, commit genocide mm. against the Jewish people. Yeah, because his plan was to wipe out the entire race, wasn't it? That was uh, what he was intending to do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a terrible thing, but if you look at the history of the Jewish people, it's just one attempt after another mm. to try to wipe them out and to destroy them. So if you, you again, jump in the, in the Bible and have a look into the book of Esther, and you, you learn the story of how Esther was taken into the palace because Queen Vashti was banished because she disobeyed the king, mm-hmm. and there was like a beauty contest Uh, Esther won the beauty contest and she eventually became queen. In all of this, you've got Mordecai, who was her uncle, who had said to her, okay, you've been taken, we can't do anything about that, but don't let anybody know that you're Jewish. Her name was probably Hadassah. And then the uh, Persian translation of that becomes Esther. So she takes on the name of Esther. And um, so she hides her Jewishness and her heritage. Mordecai is her uncle and guardian Somewhere along the line, she lost her parents. The Bible doesn't say how. And uh, he kind of is very faithful to the king. He's very faithful to the country that Mm. they're living in. Um, Obviously part of the exiles after the Babylonian um, exile. But then you've got this nasty, evil, wicked, boo, hiss, Haman, who hates the Jewish people. And he particularly hates Mordecai. Now, the story actually does tell us that it was because Mordecai wouldn't bow and pay homage to him. I mean, he was very high up in the government, but he wasn't God and he Mm. wasn't the king. But Haman wanted all this glory for himself. There is actually a much deeper reason for why Haman hated Mordecai so much. But we're going to get to that in another episode. <laughs> you mentioned a couple of times the book of Esther, and you can literally sit and read it in a, in a reading. It's not Easy, that long. Yeah. But it's uh, interesting and unique in that the book of Esther is the only one that doesn't specifically mention the name of God. Absolutely. Do you know when they were working on the canon of the Old Testament books and what should be included – There was a little bit of vacillation for a little while in that they vacillated over whether or not it should be included Mm. in the canon because it didn't contain the name of God. But what they... What the the um, the Jewish sages and the rabbis and the leaders, because I mean, by the time you get to round about the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah's time, pretty much nearly all of the Old Testament canon was already set. So they'd already decided um, at that time that Esther was included. It's because it's because God, while not mentioned, is literally working behind the scenes. Mm. 
um, to make sure that his people are saved. Because there's not even there's no mention of God. There's not even a mention of prayer. There's a mention of fasting, obviously. But mm-hmm. so he's not mentioned. But he's working behind the scenes always to ensure that his people will always survive. Yeah. You can certainly see God's protection in the, in the story, can't you? The oh. way that uh, they, they are protected from uh, the, the plot that uh, was set to uh, wipe them out. Yeah, exactly. Now, and, as, and as I mentioned, the name Purim actually means lots, which is what Haman used when he was casting lots. And, of course, we, there is a very, very well-known passage where Esther, she is supposed to, you know, Mordecai says, well, who knows? Maybe you've come into the palace for such a time as mm. this. And she said, but I can't go before the king. He hasn't summoned me for ages and I can't just present myself because I, I literally, he's going to take my head off. Yeah. It's a death sentence. But he says, well, maybe this is why you're here and don't think that if you try to save yourself, you're going to escape this slaughter, but God will raise somebody else up. Mm. To bring about our deliverance, but you're going to be lost. So she says, right, oh, she calls a fast, and then she goes before the king, and as we know, it's wonderful. He hands out, uh, hands the scepter forth, and he says, what do you want? And she wants to have dinner. She wants to be sneaky about this. She's got to reveal to him that her life and her people are in danger because of an insane madman. But she's got to do it in such a way mm. that the madman is actually right there and he's caught <laughs> red-handed. And um, it's actually, it's a really interesting story. You know, it's you've got villains and you've got, you know, you've got the heroine in yeah. it all and she's beautiful and you've got the, you know, you've got the macho king who's going <laughs> to rescue and save the day and there's there's all these plots and twists and turns. So it's actually a great story, but it's not a work of fiction. Mm. Not at all. It's a really, really serious story. And the preservation of the Jewish people under really severe hardship, genocidal threats and all that, it's a theme, as we mentioned at the beginning, woven throughout their history. And Haman has kind of become like this metaphor for like evil Pharaoh um, or Antiochus Epiphanes, who headed up the Seleucid Empire, um, who was just a really, really evil brutal, you know, tyrant over the Jewish people. Um, then there's even uh, Chmielniki, who was the one who conducted a lot of the pogroms that just slaughtered uh, Jews in Russia, and even Adolf Hitler. Yeah. I mean, with the Holocaust, which was just absolutely appalling. In fact, in a speech in 1944, Adolf Hitler actually said that if the Nazis were defeated, the Jewish people would celebrate a second triumphant Purim. I find that absolutely fascinating that Adolf Hitler, who despised the Jews so much, actually knew so much about them Mm. Uh, and and actually didn't learn the lesson. Every time somebody tried to wipe them out, (laughs) they survived and the villains were annihilated. He didn't learn the lesson and what happened to him? So it's very interesting. But what a lot of people don't realise, Haman was called the Agagite not realising that the Agagites were actually the descendants of the Amalekites. And the Amalekites were the very first nation to try to wipe out the Jewish people when they came out of the wilderness. The Jewish people hadn't raised a sword. They'd done nothing at this stage. And it was the Amalekites that tried to wipe them out. And as a result, God brought a curse on the Amalekites. And not just that, the curse was, was not just that they were to be wiped out, but that their names would be blotted out from under heaven. Now, we've just spent the last couple of programs talking about why names are so important Mm. because they tell a story or they're a heritage or something, but the curse, particularly in the Far East and the Middle East, it is such a shameful thing to have your name blotted out. So in the coming two programs, we're going to continue to learn about this festival of Purim. What is the history to it? And also, next time, we will explore more about blotting out names and the significance of it to the Jewish people. That's to come on Foundations. This has been Foundations, a look at the Jewish foundations of our Christian faith. For study notes, resources and more, see vision.org.au slash foundations. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.